Hello, good morning, everybody. We've had a few minutes to get make some introductions, but I want to formally welcome everybody to the DMD Emerging Medical Innovation Valuation Competition. And this is a, a interesting way of that we're learning how to do a lot of business. So thanks for joining virtually today, and we should be, be able to make this work for everybody. So it's, uh, helping me today is Mike Finch. We've worked together for quite a while in the Millie organization. And then uh, Gary Williams, who's been talking, and Tricia Huntosh, make sure everything's working smoothly. So today we will hear from four project teams as they discuss their medical device innovations and have a Q&A after each project. Uh, from my perspective, we have four compelling projects, and I'm very interested in listening to everybody and seeing uh, um, you know, how, how they see their project and uh, can answer some of the questions. and see themselves moving forward. So, so let's see the, uh, so next slide, Gary, please. <clears throat> so a little bit of an introduction, Mike Finch, who's uh, been involved with Millie, as I mentioned, executive residence and key uh, person in the valuation lab, and has also has been instrumental at the Children's Hospital of Minnesota for a number of years. Paul Gam is Millie executive in residence as well. He is CEO and founder of Zurich Medical, not to be, be confused with the Chicago organization. <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless that's a secret boy. <laughs> and, and before that, he was VP of International Business Development at St. Jude Medical, now Abbott, and uh, uh, previous experiences. Matt Stoll has been adjunct instructor of Valuation Lab uh, for a number of years and uh, has been New Ventures product manager at Metatronics most recently. And, and then myself, I've been involved with Millie for a number of years, executive residence in the valuation lab in the past. I'm uh, sorry. Yeah. And uh, I was CEO and founder of Evergreen Medical Technologies, a, a company that did contract uh, development and manufacturing for a number of startups. And I uh, spent a lot of time in the medical device community here. So, uh, so we're, I think we talked a little bit about this. We're all learning how to do our work virtually. So we should be able to coordinate this. I think Gary's got it set up pretty well. So I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from everybody and then uh, doing the pre-recorded video and then open it up to Q&A and listen to each of the presenters and uh, learning more about the project. So Gary, you wanna start? Uh, with that next next slide. So we'll be going in this order on the four projects. And then uh, uh, we'll have, after after the projects are all uh, discussed in Q&A, then the judges will be getting together virtually, of course, and we'll be able to announce the, the winner uh, by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Any questions? Uh, the top presenter will be uh, awarded a valuation from the valuation lab, which has uh, been around for, boy, Mike, I've lost track now, 10 plus, 12, 13 years. And uh, it has done a lot of valuations for startups and some larger companies too, it provided a pretty valuable service. So that, that'll be a, a good a good feature for the, the winner of the competition today. Ready? So, so first project to be presented is a prosthetic sock management tool. Uh, Billy Slater, and we can, we can start the presentation. My name is Billy Slater. I'm the Innovation Specialist at the Minneapolis VA Healthcare System, and I thank you for inviting me to give my presentation to you at the Special Valuation Competition. I'm talking to you today about a special project I've been working on for the past three years with the support of the VHA Innovators Network, the Prosthetic Sock Management Tool. Prosthetic Sock? What is that, you may say? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. I would like to begin by telling you a little bit about the amputation situation in the United States. The Amputee Coalition says, it's not uncommon 
and it's becoming less uncommon every day. In a single year alone, there are over 185,000 new lower limb amputations in the United States, usually through the bottom portion of the leg, or transtibial, or through the upper portion of the leg, transfemoral. An amputation is usually one of two varieties, traumatic or non-traumatic. Traumatic amputations are due to accidents, car, motorcycle, farm, or lawnmowers. They can also be due to combat injury and gunshot wounds. Non-traumatic amputations can be due to medical conditions such as cancer, diabetes, or vascular disease. They can also be due to limb differences, requiring amputation to permit the use of a prosthesis. Amputations have a cost not only in dollars, but also for the people who experience them. There is a physical as well as psychological price to pay that goes along with the loss of a limb. In 2016 alone, Medicare paid out more than $717 million in expenditures for nearly 2.11 million prosthetic services. Wound-related complications are a large cause of rehospitalizations and post-amputation. We will see how this is related to prosthetic sock management in just a bit. So what can a person expect post-amputation? With good care and rehabilitation services, a person can maximize their mobility as the situation allows and work toward their desired level of participation so they can do the things they desire to do. Acknowledging the importance of pre, post, and rehabilitative care for people having an amputation. In 2017, the VA and DOD together issued revised clinical practice guidelines for rehabilitation for individuals with lower limb amputations. In these guidelines, physical and functional interventions for prosthetic training are to be provided to patients. This includes residual limb management, including the donning and doffing of prosthetic socks. There they are. Now, let's get back to prosthetic socks. Not all people who use a prosthesis also use prosthetic socks, but for those folks who do, these socks play a big role in managing the fit and comfort of the prosthetic socket. Prosthetic socks have similarities with socks for intact feet. They come in different sizes, lengths, and thicknesses, or ply. Please imagine a dress sock, an athletic sock, and a hiking sock. The three socks are analogous to the one-ply, the three-ply, and the five-ply prosthetic sock. The prosthetic sock does not interface directly with the skin, but is applied over a thinner nylon sheath, or thicker gel liner. Donning and doffing prosthetic socks is a method of accommodating the fluctuation in residual limb volume that may be a daily occurrence. Because many sockets are rigid and cannot expand and contract as the limb changes volume, socks can be used to provide cushioning, absorb perspiration, and to fill up extra space inside the socket when needed to provide a good and comfortable fit. Likewise, socks can be removed when residual limb size increases to accommodate extra volume. As you can see, the correct use of prosthetic socks is an integral part of residual limb management. So, what happens when the socks are not managed correctly? Well, it's not good. Incorrect prosthetic sock use is something that most prosthetists I've spoken with report seeing daily. It is a serious and persistent problem. What are some consequences of improper socking? Discomfort, wound formation, infection, revision surgery, and repeat amputation. Many people with lower limb amputation have compromised circulation due to diabetes or peripheral artery disease. It may be very difficult for wounds to heal for a person with compromised circulation. The results can be disastrous. So let me tell you about the prosthetic sock management tool. It is an easy to use, simple to understand, machine washable, two-part educational tool for teaching and reinforcing the proper use of prosthetic socks. It consists of a three zippered pouch system and a laminated infographic. The pouch system has three zippered po pockets and they are labeled to contain specific ply of socks. The laminated infographic covers three important areas, as identified by our clinicians. Donning and doffing the correct number of sock ply, performing regular fit and comfort checks throughout the day, 
not just the end of the day, and a reminder to wash and dry the socks. The PSMT is used by clinicians to perform sock education at many points during the rehabilitation and prosthetic fitting process. It is also a tool for the creation of new positive habits in the post-amputation phase, especially those regarding proper donning and docking of sock ply as appropriate. It will also support creating the habit of conducting fit and comfort checks throughout the day and importantly includes the reminder for cleaning the socks. Clean socks are good socks. In other words, the PSMT helps the person using it to manage their prosthetic socks. I'm happy to report that the PSMT was developed with input from patients and clinicians. The IP for the PSMT is owned by the Department of Veterans Affairs and has passed through the provisional patent stage and is docketed for review with its patent pending. Let me tell you a little about what people have to say. A pilot study of the PSMT was conducted last year. The PSMT was used by the prosthetics resident with a patient who had continued difficult time understanding how to correctly use his prosthetic socks. This patient had a large wound on the bottom of his residual limb caused by wearing too many socks and was unable to wear his prosthesis. The resident used the PSMT for instruction. The patient went home with his new PSMT. After several weeks of using the PSMT, the patient returned to clinic for a checkup of his limb. He said, I finally understand how to use the socks. The PSMT has changed my life. He kept the infographic on his kitchen table so that when he had his coffee throughout the day, he could review it for what to do with his socks. I look forward to our next data collection. I had the opportunity this past year to be a presenter at multiple assemblies of the prosthetics industry. I spoke with many prosthetics professionals. I heard again and again, where can I buy this? Why hasn't this been done before? There's nothing like it on the market. We are looking for a commercial partner to bring this innovative product to market. We ask for your help in making this a reality. Please help us to bring the prosthetic sock management tool to the people who need it the most. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay, Paul, you wanna start with questions? Yes, I do, thank you very much. Billy, thank you for the uh, very nice presentation. Can you speak a, a bit to the uh, intellectual property and the other potential barriers of entry, please? With intellectual property, um, I filled out all the correct documentation removed through the provisional patent uh, process. Uh, the, fir the first submission was in December of 2018. So um, it had that first year of, I think I would call it waiting, um, around June of 2000. Nineteen. This isn't right. 2017, it was submitted. 2019, it was um, moved from provisional patent application to a, a design patent. And now um, I'm working with the tech transfer office in DC. Uh, and the last I've heard about a week ago is that it has been docketed for review. The, the, um, uh, what I was trying to get to is uh, two points. One is, in, I, I'm not, clearly I'm not familiar with your patent, but can you speak to what, what do you see are unique and, and also defendable? And separately, aside from the patent, what barrier, other barriers of entries do you see? Okay, I see. Um, the patent includes the notion that these zippered pouches are an educational tool, not just a storage pouch that you could buy at any, any given store. So it's the pouches in conjunction with the infographic meet, meet uh, an existing need that's known for which there is no direct competitor. So no one else that I know of has taken this approach to education and to the solving of a very expensive problem. So it's, um, this is my first patent application. I'm not sure of the nuances. I, I can't better, I cannot better answer your question. I, okay. I okay. sorry. Let's go all right. Uh, 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 the second part of my question is, okay, you got your patent. Let, let, let's say you do it and it gets issued. What would prevent me from, from just basically doing the same thing? Like what, what, what area of entries do you see? What would prevent you from doing it? Um, yeah. 
and trying to sell it. I think the, the patent, like with anything, the patent, if, if it was to be found that you had made a duplicate of the PSMT project, then the government would pursue patent infringement. Okay. I know, okay. you're gonna laugh, they probably, I, that's, that's theoretically, I don't know, <laughs> I really don't know. I, what prevents anyone from copying anyone? It's, I'm sorry. No, no, quite, quite right, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, Karen? Yeah, um, good morning, uh, good morning. thanks for presenting. I have a question about, um, being able to um, provide this within the VA system. So have you had interest from the VA to um, offer this to patients? Um, have they, do you have uh, a manufacturer for it? And do you, is the VA interested in further developing this and manufacturing it and providing it to their patients? Excellent question. Thank you for asking it, because I do have an answer for this one. <laughs> um, I had the opportunity in February to be on the call of the Regional Amputation Center clinicians, the RAC clinicians. Um, and at each of those sites, there are seven of those sites, and then there are additional sites where there are regional, I'm sorry, where there are amputation rehabilitation coordinators. So there are 26 clinicians, some are social workers, some are OTs, some are prosthetists, who work with the amputees um, in the post-amputation, pre-amputation, post-amputation, and then ongoing care scenarios. They, of these 26 people who I addressed on the conference call, six of them reached out to me after the call was completed and said, when you have manufactured the PSMT, please send us some. We would be happy to do any data collection that you need. We are interested in using this today with our patients, six. So that's just with the first look, the, when I presented to the meeting, folks had probably never heard of the PSMT before. So I thought it was an excellent response that six people said, we want in, take our names and we want in. So the PSMT that you see featured in the presentation is a homemade PSMT, not professionally manufactured. It's my design. Um, I am not a designer. I'm a craft sewer, and that's what I came up with just to illustrate as a prototype of the design. So in addition to the six people that uh, called and said they do want it now, a couple weeks later, one of, one of the six people said, can you just send it to me? I know it's not your final prototype. I have a patient that it would be perfect for. Can you overnight it? So um, the PSMT, outside of uh, any other format, it was I put it in a box and I overnighted it to Denver so that the clinician who was the amputation rehabilitation coordinator could use the PSMT with her subject or with her patient. Um, in our own facility, I've had multiple requests uh, from a PT, from a physiatrist, and from several prosthetists. Um, they said, we'll give you whatever response data you need to collect from us, from the patient. We, we want it. We want one in our, each of our clinic rooms so that we can use them just as a demonstration. And we also want a couple that we can send home. So these are just the homemade ones. The, they're not very pretty. They, they're just proof of concept. But is there support for it within the VA? Yes, there is indeed. Um, I, am, I do not have a terminal degree, um, but I am a, an innovator. And um, I've been able to obtain three awards over the last three years, just shy of $100,000 um, to have these to do some pilot studies and to have them professionally manufactured. So as we speak right now, the PSMT is with the design team over in Minneapolis. And tomorrow actually I'm having the first meeting. They've sent me three prototype designs. And um, so yes, the VA does support this project. Um, I do have the ear of, the, of national office out in Richmond. Um, and she also has requested the PSMT. So yes, indeed, there is support. Great, thank you. Okay. 
Mike? Yeah, uh, oh, this, I'm so interested in this, this piece and, and the work you've done with it. Do you have any idea how much it costs to manufacture? We're if looking you, at about $47. $47, okay. And just, just for this, this limited run of two, I'm having 200 made, this limited okay. run of 200. Okay, okay. And is, who owns the patent, you or the VA? The VA. Okay. And is the VA interested in moving this along as uh, a commercial product or how it does that work? It okay. absolutely is. At the bottom of my fourth slide, I've given reference, uh, uh, a link to uh, an organization that con is contracted by the VA for the commercialization of technology. Yep, okay. So That's TechLink. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Good. So, uh, Billy, I, I just had a, a question. Do you, what would you anticipate the selling price to be? My guess is around $50, $55 selling price. But at large manufacturing, uh, when you're making more than 200 prototypes, the price would come way down. I'm looking to simplify the pattern. Um, because I'm doing such a small run, of course, the price is higher, just 200. And this is also in wrapping in the design, the design kit. That's another thing I wanted to mention. If someone were to license this uh, product, what, I'm, what I am building right now with the manufacturer is a, a non-proprietary design kit that has the pattern, the specifications, the stitching, the stitch length, everything. That's almost a plug and play. So if someone did not want to change the dimensions or um, shape of the PSMT, there's a plug and play design kit that would be also available with licensing. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Thank you. So let's move on to the second presentation. Okay, so uh, MRI guided biopsies from Sam uh, Frischman. Go ahead, Samuel. Thank you for this opportunity to take part in the 2020 valuation competition. I'm from Stanford University and will present on a teleoperation device that enables in-bore MRI guided biopsies. Liver cancer is projected to be the third largest cancer related death by 2030 with over 30,000 diagnosed annually in the United States alone. Needle biopsy is necessary for diagnosis and treatment decisions, and subsequently, liver is one of the most common organs to biopsy. A number of imaging modalities can be used as guidance during liver biopsies, specifically ultrasound or CT. However, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, provides the clearest and most prolonged visualization of the liver and suspect lesions. In some instances, as in the scans shown here, MRI is the only way to visualize certain lesions. However, today's MRI-guided procedures require moving the patient out of the imaging bore for needle insertion. Needles are driven incrementally, with imaging scans occurring between partial insertions of the needle. This process results in prolonged procedures and unnecessary error in needle placement. At the same time, precision in biopsy is of growing importance, with gaining interest in tumor microenvironments and heterogeneity. As a result, there is a need for interventional radiologists to have access inside the MRI bore and live image guidance. We present a teleoperated solution that enables access inside the MRI bore. A hydrostatic transmission is used to achieve near frictionless motion and enables forces and vibrations to propagate from the needle to the remote input. Force feedback is important in MRI-guided biopsies because haptic cues help guide positions during the procedures. So this transparency between the input and output is critical. A custom pneumatic clutch is used to grab and release the needle. The clutch consists of a collet mechanism and is actuated with a foot pedal. The clip here shows the clutch opening and closing with the foot pedal off screen. The purpose of the clutch is to enable sufficient needle insertion deep inside the MRI bore. The clip at the bottom shows the operator using the clutch to insert a needle. An important takeaway is that the operator is able to feel when the needle contacts the membrane. 
This allows for perception of events that would otherwise be missed with imaging alone. We've done a number of tests to demonstrate the device's performance. We've shown that the system exhibits significant bandwidth and near unity force tracking. Again, that's critical for precise needle manipulation. We've also run a user study and shown that operating the device is as accurate as holding a needle directly in hand for mock biopsy tasks. MRI compatibility tests show negligible change in SNR in the presence of the device. This is expected as the system is constructed entirely of non-conductive materials. At this stage, I hope I've convinced you of the need and efficacy of our technology. So now I'd like to focus on the commercial viability of the device. And with that, there are four main categories I'd like to discuss, starting with scaling to production. One of the main benefits of our system is it's fully mechanical. There are no motors or electronics. In large part, this is because of MRI compatibility requirements. However, an added benefit is it keeps costs down. Our prototypes cost less than $2,000 in hardware. And of course, this price will go up as we upgrade from laboratory systems to commercial product. However, it'll be on the order of catheter devices rather than surgical robots. And this helps with scaling. A relatively small investment will allow us to make a significant number of devices. Now shifting to IP and regulatory pathway. We have a provisional patent filed with Stanford OTL on the MRI compatible clutch. And this is really a core technology that lets the system be compact and fit inside the MRI bore. And we plan additional IP as we expand to multi-axis manipulation. We also plan a 510K class two regulatory pathway with substantial equivalence to biopsy catheters. We believe that as a passive system, the hydraulic transmission is equivalent to long catheter cables. If we run into issues with this equivalency, we may need to file a de novo classification. Because our system is constructed entirely of non-conductive materials, we can actually get the MRI safe designation without further experimentation. So we don't foresee any issues there. In terms of viability of reimbursement, our device has a lot of strengths because it benefits all major stakeholders, hospitals, physicians, patients, and payers. Hospitals benefit because reduced procedure duration means they can do more procedures. Physicians benefit from the ergonomics of a teleoperated solution. Patients benefit from accurate diagnosis and reduced trauma. And the payers benefit from both a fee-for-service and value-based perspective. Shorter procedures mean reduced cost and MRI time is extremely expensive. From a value-based mindset, accurate diagnosis in a single insertion reduces risk of infection and other expensive complications. In terms of coding, we can leverage existing codes for MRI-guided biopsies. The biopsy device market is large, over $2 billion globally, and is growing at a compound annual growth rate of over 6%. Not only are there nearly 1 million new cases of liver cancer each year, but this device has potential to become the gold standard for other organs as well. Prostate, breast, thyroid all benefit from MRI guidance. Additionally, our long-term goal includes treatment solutions as well. So the scenario would be a patient goes in for biopsy, a sample is collected and sent to pathology. If it comes back positive, the needle is switched out for an ablation probe and the tumor is targeted. Then the doctor can tell the patient, I have bad news and good news. The bad news is the lesion really was cancer. The good news is we got rid of it. Of course, this is a long-term vision, but in the short term, we're planning an animal study. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, questions? Paul? Well, Thank you. Uh, Sam, thank you very much for the presentation. Can you, um, you, you talked about the biopsy market. Can you uh, help us better understand the relevant part of that? In, in other words, specifically, what, um, the percentage or, or the size of uh, procedures that are uh, done with MRI guidance? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, today, uh, as was mentioned, the, the majority of uh, biopsies are done uh, with CT or ultrasound guidance. Um, and in some sense, we hope to change that with this device because part of the reason is that uh, with an MRI, it takes a really long time. Uh, the procedure takes a long time because you have to do this iterative process. Nevertheless, um, with liver and, uh, and several other organs, still around 20% of these biopsies have to be done with MRI because uh, there's just no other way to visualize the lesions uh, clearly enough. Um, and so, 
Uh, specifically with liver, there's about 30,000 new cases in, in the United States. Um, and so, you know, you know, 20% of that uh, would be uh, around what's done um, with, with MRI. And of course, uh, as was mentioned, there's, there's a large uh, number of other organs. Um, we're targeting liver specifically as an initial uh, application because it's one of the most challenging. Uh, so if you just think about the anatomy, the liver is to do a in-bore MRI guided liver biopsy, the device has to be really deep inside the MRI bore. Um, whereas for some of these other organs, say a prostate, actually the majority of the system can sit outside, uh, kind of on the bed rather than between the patient and bore wall. Um, so you have a lot more uh, kind of of a workspace and, 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 and whatnot. So if we can solve the liver, uh, then all these other organs, um, you, you know, we can adapt the system uh, to, to those as well. Um, and additionally, uh, the, the reason why we're starting with liver specifically is that uh, it's one of the most, uh, there's a, a big discrepancy between um, what you can do with CT versus what you can do with MRI. So with CT, the physician can only see the lesion for about 30 seconds. Um, and the contrast that they use are, are quite uh, harmful, uh, the, the CT radiation as, as well. Where, so they can't just give you kind of more contrast and, and more CT. Um, whereas with MRI, they can visualize this lesion uh, with the contrast for upwards of 30 minutes. So they can do a very precise uh, biopsy. Thank you. Matt? Morning, Sam. Uh, so when you talked about um, regulatory, you mentioned, I, I, and I apologize, I was thinking while you were talking, um, you mentioned the risk of this having to go de novo. What, yeah. What would you anticipate that study looking like? Yeah. So uh, one of the challenges and the reason that uh, I mentioned that is that there are, uh, it, you know, this system is fully mechanical. It's, it's, it's passive. All the energy comes uh, from the operator. Uh, so I think we have a, a good argument that, well, really, it's just, uh, you know, works how a catheter works. It's a, you know, you have a long uh, cable. Uh, here we have uh, a hydraulic channel. Um, that's uh, how we feel we'll see uh, kind of what the FDA says. Um, so what it would really come down to at that, at that stage then, if we had to file de novo, is showing that um, the added kind of hydraulics uh, don't create any kind of additional risk factors. Um, so, you know, we're running this at a relatively low pressure. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, kind of energy stored in the system. Um, and so uh, we don't think, we don't foresee uh, really uh, kind of any issues there. However, okay, we acknowledge that there really aren't any hydraulic, so to speak, uh, devices on the market. So, so that would really be what the, this study has to focus on, is, is essentially showing that um, th there's no added risk here from having a hydraulic system versus, say, you know, a, a steel cable or, or whatever these uh, catheters uh, may be using. And, I, and one other question. Do you, do you, have you thought about any potential distribution partners? Are there, are there companies that are kind of playing in a similar space here? I know you're kind of creating a new model here, but who would you partner up with to sell this? Yeah, th th that's uh, a great question. Something uh, I've thought a little bit about, I don't have a, a great answer for. We use, uh, at Stanford, we use a, a bunch of GE scanners. <laughs> so that's what our uh, uh, imaging center has. Um, and some of the grants uh, that, that, that we've applied to have been um, uh, GE funded. So uh, that, that could be one avenue is, you, you know, pick a, a manufacturer of these uh, MRI machines. Uh, that's a, a, a little bit uh, different than their common, uh, you know, their main uh, area of expertise, but perhaps they would be interested. And then, of course, there's all these uh, other companies doing uh, kind of teleoperated procedures. So say intuitive surgical or uh, burb uh, surgical that are, uh, it's an entirely different space, but uh, actually some of the under underlying technologies might be of interest to them uh, even outside of biopsies, because you can imagine um, a very thin hydraulic uh, transmission uh, ha actually may have some benefits over uh, kind of a, a, a metal cable um, that is currently employed by companies like Intuitive or verb. Thank you. Thank you. Karen? Yeah, um, I was thinking about uh, reimbursement and that this would be likely bundled together into the total reimbursement for a biopsy procedure. Um, and you talk to hospital administrators or payers in order to get their interest in the product? 
there was a little bit of static, so, but I think I made out the question. I'll just repeat it uh, if you confirm. So uh, about uh, the question was about reimbursement and whether um, we've thought about uh, talk to payers or others at the hospital, how much uh, these procedures cost and whatnot. Okay. Um, so I haven't talked to any uh, payers, but but we do work with uh, some uh, physicians, some interventional radiologists, and um, for, and also from from our research. So uh, biopsy procedures, of course, there's a large range, but say with liver biopsy, it's about two to three thousand uh, dollars for a biopsy. Um, and uh, you know the the way that I look at the kind of reimbursement opportunity here is with the considering, of course, willingness to pay for quality of life here gain, so cost effectiveness. Um, and, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, that that is uh, it's one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars per quality of life year gained. And in the biopsy market, there's uh, there's, there's a lot of quality of life years to be gained. And and uh, uh, because early diagnosis uh, and accurate diagnosis is very important. So misdetections are extremely costly. If you catch cancer early, um, then uh, the the. the treatment is much more successful than if you catch it late. And this is something that RS Health, uh, as I'm sure many of you have heard, uh, we're able to leverage because that's particularly true with lung biopsies. So if you catch a lung biopsy early, uh, you know, a person can live 10, 20 years. If you catch it two years, three years later, then their prognosis is, is, is pretty bad. So uh, there's a lot of uh, quality of life years um, to be gained. Uh, liver and, and, and breast prostate, they're a little bit different than lung. Uh, but but on top of the um, the life years, there's also uh, decreased risk of infection. So if you can do this through one insertion, uh, rather than uh, the way today it works is with the worst imaging, if the physician misses the target, they'll actually kind of retract the needle and try again. And so there's uh, increased risk of infection. And uh, for some procedures, that can be actually as high as 17%. For, for most procedures, it's around 2 to 3%. Um, but if we can cut into that, and that's actually uh, what our um, uh, what one of the study designs we would do is basically showing how much uh, reduction of needle in insertions uh, does this device generate, because we can directly relate that to a re re decreased risk of infection, and then directly relate that to quality of life years, and uh, uh, show that um, you know this is worth X. Uh, increase in cost. And, and actually, our, our rough estimates is that you could increase uh, the biopsy costs actually by $2,000 about um, and uh, still be within well within um, that willingness to pay um, uh, in, in the United States. Um, and to add to that, actually, we certainly wouldn't need to increase the biopsy cost by that much because this device, as, as I mentioned, it's fully mechanical. So we don't expect a very high cost. We, we think we can we could sell these for fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, but um, and they're not disposable, right? You use that for for you know potentially uh, many years. Um, but uh, the, I guess the takeaway is that there is actually a, a lot of room in the biopsy to market biopsy market to increase the cost of the procedure if you can really show that you're generating value through quality of life years. Great, thanks, Mike. Mike, did you have a question? I'm sorry, I was muted. Yeah, we're gonna disagree on a few things, I guess. Um, oh. <laughs> today's market for reimbursement is not about increasing costs on anything, even for quality of life. It's decreasing cost at the same or better quality of life. So uh, it's, I think it's a little unrealistic to think if you can add another $100,000 to this and get it back. If you did raise, put $100,000 as your sales price or 50,000, What's the payback period for this, number one? And number two, how do you see cannibalizing the uh, ultrasound guided, CT guided uh, market? Because yeah, so, they have different prices too, and ultrasound is actually quite inexpensive, even with their infection rate. Yeah, so uh, to your first point, uh, absolutely, I agree that, you know, ideally uh, this decreased cost, and, and the point I was making there is that uh, you know, we think there is room uh, for that increased cost, but we actually do think that this device would decrease costs, as you say, because uh, um, as I mentioned in, in the uh, presentation, um, it reduces uh, procedure duration of uh, today's MRI uh, procedures. So um, 
uh, I, I wasn't intending to say that, you know, this, the only avenue here is to kind of increase costs. Um, and in fact, uh, a procedure like this, I think, in even a fee-for-service mindset, uh, decreases cost because it reduces largely um, the, the MRI time. Um, and then also from a value-based perspective, you don't have to bring the patient back in, uh, you know, a year or so to, to do the same thing. Um, and you don't, you have a decreased risk infection. Um, but, but thank you. For, uh, that, that's a, a great point. Um, and so your second question was on the uh, cannibalization of uh, ultrasound and CT. Um, and, and that's a, a, a really good point that, um, you know, anytime you start shaking things up, there might be a little bit of uh, pushback, right? So if, if we're shifting from what uh, a, a doctor does today, uh, the, the way they do the procedure, we're kind of moving it to a different position, say, um, an interventional uh, radiologist who, uh, you know, works with MRI procedures. Um, so I guess the, the way to answer that is our initial uh, kind of uh, path to market is, is not really by cam cannibalizing, it's by improving the current procedures, which, you know, we, we think that there are uh, a large number of uh, MRI guided biopsies today. So the, the first step would be by um, improving those. And then uh, I guess the, the, as people um, see the benefit and also as the market moves to that naturally, um, we'll have, you know, we will be well positioned to, use, to, to be doing those procedures because really the, 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 I guess the bottom line is that in 10 years, uh, five, 10 years, uh, MRI guided biopsies are gonna be kind of the dominant form. It's a, it's a better, safer form of uh, imaging. Um, and so it's just a matter of a, essentially kind of which device uh, 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 gets there early and kind of dominates that market because, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of movement away from CT uh, that, that, that has inherent issues with radiology, both for the patient, or sorry, radiation for both the patient and the tech um, and the imaging quality. They don't get it for long enough. Um, and there's increased need for precision and biopsy, as I mentioned, because uh, there's more and more interest in these uh, tumor heterogeneity and microenvironments, uh, meaning they need not just a sample of one, you know, the tumor itself, but of a bunch of points along the tumor to see how it's been growing and uh, dictate treatment. Um, and really, you know, if we look at biopsy needles, they, they haven't changed. We haven't changed the way we do these biopsies to a certain degree in, in, in a long time, uh, whereas the imaging has gotten so much better. So say, you know, 50 years ago, we didn't have this uh, capability necessarily. So um, I guess the, the, the technology to, to manipulate the needle is, is now starting to catch up a little. Excellent. I hope that good, answered your question. Well, good, good response. And don't get me wrong, I love your device, but I'm going to push you on the business Thanks. aspects of it. Yeah, so. <laughs> thank you. No, that, that's a great point. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. So th uh, thank you, Samuel. Uh, let's tee up the next presentation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julie Kazi, and I'm with Biotech MD, and we have a breakthrough medical device treatment in the prevention of preterm birth. What I'd like to do today is tell you just a little bit about uh, not only our business model, uh, but the actual problem that we're attacking here, which is the prevention of preterm birth and our solution, which is a cervical stabilization device. I'm going to start with a, uh, a five minute video, and then we're going to spend three minutes talking about the business model. Preterm birth is a growing global human health care crisis involving more than one in every 10 pregnancies and is the leading cause of infant death and morbidity within the first month of life, its socioeconomic consequences exceeding $52 billion each year. Conditions known to contribute to preterm birth include incompetent cervix, organ and tissue compromise, multiple fetus pregnancies, late life pregnancies, too early in life pregnancies, and more. No proven treatments exist for conditions that may lead to preterm birth, particularly for mid to early term indications occurring before rescue and emergency treatment is possible. Early warning signs are common, including multiple fetuses, widening or opening of the cervical canal, 
thinning and shortening of the uterine cervix, and other indications of an accelerated effacement and dilation process. As pregnancy progresses, bearing forces acting upon the uterine cervix stimulate hormonal changes that drive the effacement and dilation process. When this process becomes overly accelerated, and in the case of incompetent cervix and certain other conditions, the risk of preterm birth becomes a paramount concern. Bearing forces imposing upon a compromised uterine cervix can cause premature rupture of membranes, leading to an untimely birthing event that can have tragic consequences. Premature birth is a significant cause of lifelong crippling disease, including autism, cerebral palsy, blindness, deafness, cognitive disabilities, and more. Viatech MD's patented cervical stabilization device, known as CSD, offers the first and only early to late stage, medication-free and non-invasive treatment for a wide range of conditions known to contribute to preterm birth. The device is comprised of a cervical cup, including highly compliant lip portions, a balloon portion, and resilient core tube, providing natural ventilation and drainage and linear structure. CSD is designed to resist and limit bearing forces acting upon the uterine cervix in order to reduce effacement and dilation stimuli. This function is accomplished by isolating and protecting the uterine cervix within the device's cup-like feature, including its highly compliant lip portions, which gently engage the posterior and anterior cervical fornices to oppose bearing forces while bridging and disposing of those forces, by supple nesting of the device's impassable volume upon the tissues of the pelvic floor. CSD is positioned by introducing the device in its deflated form, properly oriented so that the cervical cup portion surrounds the uterine cervix while the cup's lip portions engage the cervical fornices. CSD is inflated to achieve individualized fitment for a wide range of patient types. On a case-to-case -case basis, Patient fitment may be long-term, from the onset of early indications to as short as days when CSD may be utilized in support of cerclage. CSD may be removed from time to time as pregnancy progresses to be replaced with an incrementally shorter device, providing for a controlled and more natural progression of the effacement and dilation process. As controlled effacement and dilation progresses, the gentle contact of the device's lip portion then engages the thinning tissues of the cervix, thereby supporting the amniotic sac to prevent premature rupture of membranes. With CSD in place, a patient experiencing a complicated pregnancy will find comfort knowing the risk of preterm rupture of membranes and preterm birth is greatly reduced in many cases allowing the patient to resume generally normal activities until the time of birth. By utilizing CSD to slow and control the effacement and dilation process, full-term and natural birthing experiences will replace often tragic rescue and emergency treatments involving risky and unproven cerclage and pharmaceutical therapy that do not assure full-term outcomes and often demand cesarean section deliveries. So what we have here is a company that has a remarkable combination of being a high impact company, uh, as well as being one with tremendous economic upside. And as you well know, those are both rocket fuel to an early stage company. They have an impact company, which is very interesting to investors, but also one with tremendous economic upside. Um, in the context of, um, of this device, um, we are, uh, we are really um, focused on three kinds of impact, impact. One is save the babies and obviously prevent the morbidity that's associated with those babies that are born way too early. The second is the disruption of the healthcare industry because we have the opportunity here to take tremendous expense out of the healthcare system. This is not only a very high volume uh, medical issue, but it's also one that's very expensive on an incident to incident basis. Uh, the third is that women of color are have a 50% higher incident of preterm birth. And so there's an issue of 
of uh, public health here and equity, if you will. From an operating and business strategy standpoint, we really are focused on, on partnering with world-class staff. We work with Freudenberg on the manufacturing side and have scalable manufacturing uh, already at this point. Um, Styrus is our CRO, our contract research organization. Mark Duvall and team are regulatory counsel and they do a phenomenal job. Many of you know them. Um, and we're focused on an exit strategy really within two or three years uh, that would mean Viatech uh, being sold to a big multinational like a Boston Scientific. Um, that's an example of a company that has tremendous depth in men's and women's health, but doesn't have a, a lot of depth in uh, OB gynecology in particular, and, nor do any of the other big multinationals. And we'd like to do so with United Healthcare being a huge partner of ours in the market making, if you will. Um, they're very interested, um, and we've talked to their, uh, a bunch to their chief medical officer, Dr. Migliori, uh, about making it standard of care for the physicians in their, um, in their operation. They've got 120 million covered lives, and the physicians that represent those patients um, are obviously deep and wide. Um, and so thinking about an exit to a Boston Scientific with the market making from USG, UHG, um, you can see here that our financial projections are absolutely stratospheric. Um, we could talk in more depth at another time about that. Uh, at the moment, we've raised three and a half million, uh, all, in, all in friends and family, and we're seeking an additional $8 million of capital to get to exit. Uh, that first uh, million and a half will be spent over the next year getting the studies and trials that lead up to our Q1 FDA human clinical trial in the beginning of 2021. Um, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate the forum to speak to you. Karen. Oh, good morning. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a question. I think you said during the presentation that you have tested this device on some non-pregnant volunteers. Did I hear that correctly? That is correct. We've done a fitment study at the very beginning of 2017. We're about to enter into another one over the next uh, week or two. We'll begin that second one. And that's literally fit and comfort in non-pregnant women. Uh, the device has changed very little since then. We don't expect different results. We had tremendous success the first time through, but uh, having more current information and data would be useful to the process. Okay. So my question then is um, about both fit and comfort. I'm talking about retention of the device within the vagina and then um, any pressure or impingement on either the urethra or the rectum. And is that gonna be part of your clinical trial, looking at those kind of questions? Yes, it absolutely was and is in the context of the Fitman study, um, first of all, and will be as well when we start the human clinical trial with the FDA in uh, the beginning of 2021, so less than 12 months from now. Um, the women in the Fitman study uh, were generally comfortable enough. I, I think we can all agree that one would prefer not to be wearing a cervical stabilization device if, if given the choice, on the other hand, um, you know, wearing one in support of, of extending a pregnancy by multiple weeks is, is, you know, incredibly important to the outcomes for the babies. Uh, the women were able to, to walk stairs, to do some um, kind of gentle squatting, if you will, to urinate, to defecate, et cetera. And that was exactly what the study was, uh, was put in place. Um, I think we all know that a non-pregnant woman has less com compliant anatomy. Uh, a woman who is pregnant has you know, ha has anatomy that is that is um, more compliant in the context of adjusting to all sorts of bodily changes that are taking place. So we we actually expect pregnant women to be slightly more comfortable than the non-pregnant women, if that makes sense. Um, in terms of retention of the device, um, it's much like a diaphragm or pessary. So there are, you know, decades and decades of experience with how that fit works and and how the retention of the device works. In this case. Um, and as well as the case of a diaphragm or a pessary, um, what happened, you know, if you can picture a diaphragm gets folded in half, gets inserted into the vagina, sort of snaps into place, almost mm -hmm. suction into that, uh, those cervical fornices um, around the cervix that allows us, therefore, to utilize the whole 360 degrees of the cervix to support that weight bearing of the fetus. But then we've also got below that the balloon, which is uninflated, gets inflated after it's inserted in a very gentle sort of way so that the vaginal walls can also help with the weight bearing, if you will, of that pregnancy. And, and this is really a biomechanical solution in that we are 
um, slowing the, the biochemical process of effacement and dilation by helping to support that weight bearing um, in high risk situations. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Karen? It does, thank you. Yep. Matt? Matt, you're muted. Yep. Still on mute. There you One go. click too many. Julie, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, a question on your, your financial project projections. They, uh, they looked uh, optimistic. Um, like I should put my life savings, I should send you my life savings like tomorrow, um, which would be great. But I, I wondered if you could kind of help me understand. And Julie, you're muted. Um, help, walk us through a little bit and help us understand how you have such a, how, how the hockey stick launches quite that fast and quite that steep. Yeah, so, so let me talk about that a couple of different ways. Um, the device costs dozens of dollars to manufacture. Uh, you know, we are literally at scalable manufacturing with Freudenberg right now where they could flip a switch and go to commercialization uh, if need be. The, you know, tooling is done, the, the process is done. We believe the prototype is as it will go to market. Um, but, but we expect that the device will sell for something like $5,000 an incident. Um, you know, you remember that the average price of preterm birth is about $100,000. Um, and, you know, some of them are obviously much less expensive. Some are way into the millions with NICU experiences, et cetera. And one of the advantages that the company has is that we have payers who are highly incented to reduce their, their expenses uh, on this topic. So United Health Group, who I mentioned earlier, 120 million covered lives through their Optum network, uh, they say that their preterm birth challenge is two billion dollars a year out of park out of pocket for UHG, uh, UHC. You know that's that's an enormous number, and obviously there are tons and tons of other payers. So we have, you know, in the real life, I am a Wharton MBA in finance. You know, I hate to, you know, some of the time we're very focused on mission driven, but in this particular circumstance, having big, wealthy multinationals who are financially incented to solve this problem because they have expenses that we can help reduce is obviously tremendously useful in the context of the rocket fuel that it takes to fund an early stage company and get this product to market to save the babies, which is very much our intention and our focus. Um, the, the model is built, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a 28 page uh, Excel document. I'd be happy to send that if that were useful. It literally models country by country with, with different device prices per country and, and different market penetration. Um, you can see that the, the TAM, you know, we talked about the $50 billion a year, the five-year total accessible market, uh, we've got calculated $240 billion. So, um, you know, we're talking about a market penetration of about 3% uh, with a variety of pricings and, and penetration levels in different countries. We expect the U.S. Uh, to be first and Canada and Western Europe to be second, but there are obviously tremendous opportunities as well in terms of some of the global distribution. And, and we may even end up with a partner. We're talking to Gates Foundation. We're talking to some other, uh, the Million, uh, Million Lives Fund, which is focused on, on early births. And we may end up with some global funding to do some of that um, global distribution, if you will, um, which is not likely to be as profitable um, as, as the US and Western Europe and Canadian distribution. Um, we, for instance, have India modeled on only on a you know cash payment basis, not on you know, so it's, you know, it's, it's wealthier Indians that, that, that could potentially have access to this in the beginning stages. Um, I, you know, I agree that the financials are very optimistic. We've had long conversations about that. I'll say this one thing to you, Matt, which is that, you know, all of us that work with early stage companies a ton, and I am an LP in, a, in seven different funds and, and work with a lot of portfolio companies, you know, there are a lot of, um, I'm going to say fatal flaws that, that, um, founders can bring forward. I don't think optimistic financial projections is one of those fatal flaws. So, you know, if you assume, you know, if you assume that the financials need to be honed and you assume that the, uh, at this point, they're, they're optimistic, there's a lot of room between how the financials are written and, you know, evolving timetables and, and profitability where there's still a ton of uh, enough upside to, to bring this to market, if you will. Um, but I agree, we don't, we don't yet know until we've done some of the things like this valuation study and, and uh, you know, some other pieces around reimbursement. We don't really know exactly what that's going to look like. 
We do, we do, however, know that it's both a very high volume issue in one in 10 pregnancies and also a very expensive on every individual, you know, most individual circumstances. So just doing the math on that, we know that this is one of those devices that will save a bunch of money as we get this to market. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike? Mike, you're muted. Thank you. Two questions. What's your regulatory pathway? Yes. First question first, and then give me the other one. Yep. Um, yes, we are. Um, we are focused on. Uh, we've had three pre-submission negotiations, and at this point, uh, we expect either class two or class three, de novo or PMA. Um, the, the FDA has been tremendously uh, supportive of this process, including Benjamin Fisher, who's the division director in this area. Uh, saying to us at the end of the second pre-submission meeting that he wanted us to send him a device to put on his bookshelf. And we all, you know, we all did the happy dance and said, oh, Ben Fisher wants one on his bookshelf. You know, this is, <laughs> this is going well, right? This is, we're very, um, you know, we're happy about that. Um, we've actually been told that given the way the study runs, uh, class two and class three are not actually likely to look like very different timetables. Um, and class three would obviously provide us with much more barriers to entry in that it would take somebody else long, a longer time to catch us. So there may be advantages to either. Um, one, of, one of the big upsides in the context of the way this FDA clinical, human clinical trial uh, will, will roll is that we are likely to utilize the device in a uh, women who are at 26 to 32 weeks of gestation when the device is inserted. Um, now we, we all know that by the end of the second trimester, a fetus is gaining uh, a half a pound a week, right? So I have a baby in my world that was born at one, ten, one pound, 10 ounces. He's now 25 and he's graduated from NYU and his first job was BlackRock. He's 92% healthy, let's call him, um, and just an absolutely terrific young adult. Um, but, you know, extending that pregnancy by, by two weeks gets you to two pounds, 10 ounces, three pounds, 10 ounces, four pounds, 10 ounces. And those are Herculean differences, not only in terms of outcomes and, and probabilities of those babies living, but also in terms of the expenses on the, the system, the payers, the hospital systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, we are, we are um, focused on the fact that uh, it is true and the FDA has agreed that a, that a woman in the study only needs to be followed until the birth of the baby. There's no, at that point, they're, they're, you know, we're only doing weeks of gestation and can we extend weeks of gestation. So, we might follow, you know, the 80 to 100 women in the study, we might follow for anywhere between, you know, zero and 12 weeks, but then it's over. Our relationship with that patient is over. And so we actually, regardless of whether we end up as a class two or class three um, device, uh, we're going to have eight sites rolling and to get to 80 to 100 patients and significant data, neither we nor the FDA expects that that's going to take very long. So okay. that's, that's what we know at this point about the regulatory pathway. Does that answer your question? It does. And with all your, all your jet fuel out there and those as Matt thinks optimistic uh, financials, um, tell me about your IP position. Yes. Yes, I will. What um, exactly is covered? So uh, the founder, the founder is going to be better at this particular topic than I am, but you know, we have a glowing, uh, a growing global patent portfolio, including three issued utility patents. We're in we have uh, patents in 17 countries right now. Um, and, uh, you know, I can give you a list of the countries if that's helpful, but um, we, every indication for my, I don't know if you know Mark Duvall and, and crew, which is our regulatory council, um, yeah. you know, they, that whole team and the rest of the team that's been working on the patent portfolio is literally, you know, we are spinning patents um, forward our direction every couple of weeks and, and uh, feel like, that part of the work that we're doing is very much on track uh, with where we are as a company and will continue to grow over a period of, you know, weeks and months and years before we get to that exit. So we feel very solid in that area. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's a big issue with those financials. You're going to see people trying to bite off a piece of it. Yep. <laughs> right. That yep. through the IP. Right. Yep. Yep. I expect that. And you know, that FDA process is certainly a barrier to entry. Uh, you know, working on, we, we spent, uh, years, you know, weeks, months, years working on the, the polymers and, and the mechanics of making that a very, very, very simple device. So, you know, I would, I would challenge them to, you know, figure out how to come in very, very quickly and, and replicate that even without a patent portfolio because the, 
you know, the importance of, of both the, you know, of the drainage of, of the breathability of the device, of, of the, the compliance, the suppleness, suppleness is, is extraordinary. So I think we are, uh, you know, a very engineering driven company. And in some respects, uh, you know, part of my work is to pull us out of, you know, <laughs> the, the founder is very focused on substance and, and, you know, the rest of us need to make sure that we are packaging that in the context of a, a business model, if you will, because I think we are, you know, a hundred percent on engineering and doing just a phenomenal job on that side. So I think that's going to make it hard to compete with. Thank you. Yep. Nice. So Pam, you, uh, Paul, do you have a quick question? Yeah, a very quick one. Following up on, on, on Mike's comment about uh, regulatory path, Julie, can you comment on the uh, European Union on the CE mark? Yes, um, we've talked about we've talked about that, and I, you know, I, I think our first choice is is to start with um, start with the U.S., but um, a Canadian CE mark is is the next choice, and you know, the EU um, going the EU direction is a third choice if we end up getting hung up in the U.S. I, I. Um, our focus in part because of our relationship with United Health Group has been to start with the U.S., but if we need to, we absolutely will go the Canadian and or Western European direction first. Um, we, we are, after the Fitman study, we go directly into an OUS out of the United States study in Argentina, uh, working with our, our Cyrus partner on the CRO side of things, and we expect that to uh, generate our, our first save lives. Um, as, as well as some data that will allow us to move pretty quickly into and through that FDA process. They've not specifically requested that, but as you well know, they are able and, and willing to take that kind of um, data into consideration as, as they're looking at the risk reward trade off there. So that we expect that to start within a couple of, a number of months here. Great. Yep. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. So let's tee up the next presentation, please. So Venograph, uh, Sabin Karki. Hello, my name is Sabine Karki and I'm a senior biomedical engineering student at Johns Hopkins University and the co-founder of Venograph. We're a team of seven biomedical engineering students developing a new tool for the reconstructive surgery space, starting as a design program at Johns Hopkins about two years ago. I wanna start by posing a question. Imagine that you need to go in for a surgery, but there's a one in four chance that you'll need a reoperation. Would you still be willing to undergo this procedure? Unfortunately, these reoperation rates are the reality today in reconstructive graft rhinoplasty procedures. There are, there are approximately 200,000 graft rhinoplasty performed every year in the US. These are surgeries in which facial plastic surgeons or ENTs use cartilage taken from the patient or cadavers and shape it into the desired form to prop up or add contour to regions in the nose, either to restore functionality in breathing or for aesthetic changes. Now, nearly one in four of these procedures require a surgical revision, often at cost to the facility performing it. Why is this? The reason is due to the way that grafts are often shaped. Traditionally, a surgeon will remove a section of cartilage from the patient's septum, rib, or their ear, and carve away at the tissue using a manual blade uh, to form the desired shape. Despite rhinoplasties being the most common reconstructive procedure, it requires a really skillful method of carving to achieve a symmetric graft. Uh, furthermore, there's a high risk of the tissue warping after being implanted when carving. Reoperation is extremely costly, painful, and difficult to perform. An alternative method, which is attractive to surgeons, however, however is the use of diced grafts. Through this method, surgeons use a blade to dice the tissue into one millimeter sized pieces, and then use the tissue glue as adhesive before placing the graft into the nose. These grafts don't warp, have a far lower rate of absorption than carved grafts, and are much easier to shape because surgeons can manually mold the grafts like Play-Doh with their hands instead of carving. As a result, the reoperation rate is a much lower 4%. So why don't all surgeons use dice techniques? Uh, as we've learned, the primary reason we found is that dicing cartilage is an extremely laborious and effortful process. Meticulously chopping cartilage uniformly can take up to two hours in the operating room. It takes an average time of about 45 minutes. Over the past two years, our team has worked to develop the Benograph Rapid Dicing System, a single-use device which can effortlessly dice cartilage for reconstructive procedures. It's easy to use, powerless, and can fit in the palm of your hand. And as you can see here in the bottom left, uh, our device can chop cartilage to the necessary pea size within three minutes, whereas 
Uh, when you're chopping manually, you're still not at an implantable tea size at 25 minutes when dicing by hand. Our device can chop cartilage from all sources in over 90% less time than manual chopping, which reduces operating time, can contribute to improved outcomes, and reduces the risk of complications like warping and resorption that you see with carved cartilage. Here we can see an early prototype or device in action where a piece of cartilage is diced in less than three minutes. Now, while there are other cartilage processing tools available on the market, uh, these are focused on crushing cartilage to create flat sheets or slicing it into more carvable sections rather than dicing it. Only our device can reduce the time to create dice graphs, create consistently sized pieces, and doesn't result in cartilage cell death, which occurs when you're crushing cartilage. Existing tools in the market that crush cartilage are the caudal, Polsdorf, and the Jost cartilage crusher, which are priced at around the mid 100s to the upper 300s, $400 range. Our device, unlike these reusable tools, is disposable and single use. And we believe that $150 is a highly competitive price point based on a $30 cost to manufacture and sterilize. Our sales strategy is to distribute this device through surgical tool distributors already embedded in the reconstructive surgery space, as this is an ideal method for single use devices. Our pair mix is split with approximately 70% of graft rhinoplasties being performed in private practices and 30% in hospital setting where reimbursement can occur under bundled CPT codes. Since January, our team has filed a provisional patent to protect our cartilage dicing mechanism and our method of preventing tissue from being stuck inside the device. We submitted our data to, in a manuscript to the Journal of Medical Devices, which uh, includes the reductions in dicing time we've achieved and the reduced cartilage loss from our device compared to manual dicing by hand. Uh, further, we're also preparing for a second study, which will describe the surgeon, ex surgeon experiences using our device to create dorsal online graphs. And this data will be submitted to the Journal of Plastic, Reconstructive, and Aesthetic Surgery. As part of our marketing strategy, we'll be presenting this data at a facial plastic surgery conference in the fall. Our device is an easy to use tool we feel it would be a valuable addition to any rhinoplasty or ENT surgical tool belt. The rapid dicer not only makes graft rhinoplasty procedures faster, but makes it easier than ever before for patients to have better outcomes when they're on the operating table. Our tool easily integrates into the surgical workflow and de-skills the process for graft creation, which means any member of the surgical team, not just a surgeon, can prepare the diced tissue. With the Benegraft rapid dicing system, reconstructive surgery is faster and better. Thank you for your time, and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, all right. Um, hello, I'm online. Uh, Matt, you have a question? Yeah, Sabine, how are you? Thank you for the presentation. Thank um, you. I had a question for you on, on it, it looks like a great idea. Um, I had a uh, two quick questions for you. One on the um, the OR time savings. Sure. So what, what gets thrown around a lot is is we we track OR time savings to the minute. Um, when in reality, it's only it only becomes valuable when you can slot another procedure into the space where into the time savings that you had. Absolutely. So, so do you have any? Are, are there? When you talk about the total time savings, do you know what what a, a clinic could recover? You know, or or add in revenue based on on what you think your tool can do? Um, sure, so um, obviously it depends on the facility. The, the average rhinoplasty procedure takes around an hour and a half. Um, sometimes it can take two hours, sometimes it can take a lot longer, but an hour and a half is the mean time. And the average time we can save with our device, we found is about 40 to 42 minutes um, because it takes an average 45 minutes to dice and this does all types of cartilage in three minutes or less. Um, so with that, we're seeing a reduction of about 40% in a procedure's time. And obviously, the, the amount of extra revenue a facility can generate depends on how many rhinoplasties you're doing in the first place, right? Uh, but rhinoplasties are the most common type of reconstructive cosmetic procedure done. Um, so we anticipate that for any facility, this would be a, a good revenue generating measure. I, I think it would depend a lot on how many they do, but since they are the most common procedure, we think this would be very compelling to, to private practices. Excellent. And, and one quick question, you mentioned on the, on the product matrix, you talked about cell viability and, and I, I don't, my knowledge of rhinoplasty is limited to your deck. So um, 
Can you tell me why that's important for this, for this uh, procedure? Yeah, absolutely. So um, typically when you're using a cartilage graft, what the, the traditional way of doing it is by carving, as I explained in the video, which is where they take the on block piece of cartilage from the rib, another part of the nose or the ear, and they carve away at it. And um, cartilage typically has a lower cell density compared to other types of tissue in the first place. And once you place that carved piece of tissue into the nose, it has to reintegrate into the nasal environment to survive and persist. Otherwise, it can resorb, which means it either, well, one, one problem is it can warp, like move its shape, like after it's been placed inside, or the cells can die if there's not enough integration into the, the host environment, basically. And that's right. complicated when you're using a synthetic, which a lot of surgeons just don't touch at all, or, or even from cat cadaveric tissue. With dice cartilage, what you're doing is you're chopping up the cartilage into small enough pieces that the cells are still viable. You're not crushing them and killing the cells, and you use fiber and glue to sort of create the, the moldable structure that holds all the pieces together. And that allows for really good reintegration into the cell environment and a lot less cell death compared to crushing or, or yeah, maybe it's compared to crushing. Good deal. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Erin? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Sabine. Um, so I have a, also a question about um, the time savings. And you mentioned specifically about de-skilling this right. procedure, which is um, one, of, one of the key things that um, payers are looking for is pushing, you know, any part of the procedures down to a lower skill level. But who, who in the procedure is actually would be the person that you would push it down to? Who's actually involved in the rhinoplasty procedure? Okay. And whether the physician is, the surgeon is actually um, manipulating the cartilage tissue or you have, say, a circulating nurse or someone like that doing it, is there really any time savings there? Yeah. Absolutely. No, that's it's probably great. still going to have to be doing it. What are the rest of the people doing while that's going on? Right. So that's a great question. So right now, in all the procedures we've watched, um, the surgeon is doing it. And the reason for that is they want to make sure that the piece size, when they're manually chopping up the cartilage, is very uniform. Because if they have uneven piece sizes, then the graft is not going to hold its shape. Um, we, when we talk to... Um, and, and that's the reason that most surgeons don't want their other like, like circulating nurses or other members of the surgical team to do it. Um, when we talked to one surgeon out in California to private practice, we said, you know, is dice cartilage a problem for you? And he's like, oh, no, not at all. And I'm like, well, that's surprising. Like, how do you do it? And he's like, well, I bring in four nurses and we all chop cartilage at the same time. We get it done in 10 minutes. So, you know, they're bringing in a lot of extra people into the room. And obviously, if that surgeon is doing it by themselves, it'll take, you know, 50 minutes to five people. Um, and so... But obviously, you, you don't want to have more hands than are needed to work on something that's very simple. This is something that should be low skill. You know, a surgeon doesn't need, it shouldn't take a surgeon's level of expertise to be able to dice cartilage evenly. And, and that's not the best use of that surgeon's time or the facility's time. So with this, anybody can use it. It doesn't have to be just a surgeon because it produces a uniform piece size each time you use it, no matter who's doing it and how. It's very simple to use. So ideally, the surgeon may be working in another part of the procedure, which could be involved with, you know, like, you know, working in another part of the nose while a scrub or circulating nurse is able to do this very quickly on the side. And have you actually had those conversations with surgeons yeah. and nurses and gotten feedback from? Absolutely. Uh, so we, uh, when we did, ran our first round of formative testing back in February before all this, um, we had a lot of the surgeons, we, we had surgeons first use the device. Um, we haven't had nurses use their device yet. We've had only surgeons tested so far, but they, they have told us a lot about what they liked about the fit and feel of the device, how big they wanted it to be, whether they wanted, like, for example, like a tray to go with it to, you know, to be able to roll the cartilage in um, and, and on how much space actually have to work on the operating table or on the surgical table on the side. And, and we've incorporated all of those features into the design and all that is sort of included um, in our patent as well. And I can speak to that too if anybody has any questions. All right, Mike? Yeah, nice <clears throat> nice presentation. I like this. Uh, but I have a question for you, sure. and it has to do with the how long you have in the market, do you think, with this device? We see a lot of new technology of people growing cartilage to shape, actually, mm -hmm. uh, either from autologous or from stem cells. Right. So I assume this will affect how long you can sell this device because dicing may not be around in a few years. How long do you think that is? How long do you think you have to make money off of this? 
So, so he, so absolutely. That's a great point. I think for, frankly, my, my view of the future is the, the future of cartilage grafts is not in autologous cartilage. It's going to be in very good, like either synthetic or regenerative grafts that can be yep. grown from constructs. But um, what we, we, we try to work around that, which is that there will always be a need for dice tissue in the first place um, because that, that works better. So one of the things we talked about in our patent was um, obviously, you know, we covered our, our mechanism for dicing the cartilage and preventing cartilage entry into the actual mechanism. But we also talked about pre-processing of tissue banks because one thing we can foresee is that a tissue bank, which, which maybe either process harvest uh, cadaveric cartilage to provide to surgeons, which they already do, um, or create synthetic grafts, they may want to pre-process this cartilage and dice it and then ship it out in its diced form to surgeons. Um, so those are things we try to cover as, as possible applications in our patents as well. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Just how do you anticipate bringing this to market, and uh, as far as your uh, sales and distribution? Sure. So this is, you know, a product in a niche line. It's only in. in I mean, we, there are other applications in cranioplasty and orthopedic applications as well. We're starting with rhinoplasty because that's where dice cartilage sort of has the greatest value proposition. And so uh, we've been in sort of early conversations with Black and Black Surgical and another smaller ENT firm uh, based in Florida called Marina Medical uh, to bench, sorry to potentially license this out to them um, because they're already embedded in the system. Um, you know, they know they know the physicians already and, and we think that's going to be a lot easier than for us to try and create a sales force and get out there with a single product right now. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Of course. All right. Any final questions from the judges? Okay. Well, thank you for the presentation, sir. Very good. Very good. Uh, I'd be interested to see how how they all move forward and in my point, I think they all have some merit. So we'll get back to you by nine o'clock tomorrow morning uh, with the winner of the competition and best of luck to everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much for the forum. Thank you. Thank you all for your ideas. Take it easy now. Be safe. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.